So again, Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 to 25, and then going on through chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And it says, Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord in verse 23, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And then continuing on in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations to, of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, Lord, for the wonderful blessing and privilege that it is to be here in your house of worship, Lord, to, to hear a word from you, Lord. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would help that all of us who come here, Lord, that you would help us to put aside any anxiety that we have, anything that's pulling us away from listening to you, Lord, anything that is distracting to us, Lord, because we all come here heavy laden, Lord, we all come here with burdens, Lord, but this is a time to be refreshed, Lord, and we pray that you would do that this morning to all of us, Lord, that you would... Quiet myself, Lord, and that you would speak clearly to me this morning, that your message would help edify us all individually, Lord, and as your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's interesting, as I was thinking about what to preach about this Sunday when I, I learned that I would be here today, it's always really different how various messages come, come to us. For those of you that have preached or have spoken in front of people, it, it's always kind of difficult to make sure that you are bringing something fruitful, something meaningful. And so we always pray and say, God, please, that it would be your message, not my message. And he delivers those messages and, 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 and his guidance in very peculiar ways. And for me, it was through a word. And that word is priority. Priority. It's a simple word. What does that mean? When you think of the word priority, it almost seems like a silly question because you all almost automatically have something that comes to mind. And so I still think, though, it, it's, it's, although it's simple, I think it's also good to go through and see what the definition of that word is when you look at the dictionary or when you ask on Google to find priority. And I found three specific definitions as I was going through this, and I want to share those. And again, I think they're pretty straightforward. Shouldn't catch anybody off guard, but the first one says the fact or condition of being considered or treated as more important. All right. Now the second one, one thing that is considered more important than another. And then lastly, the right to take precedence or to proceed before others. Any of that sound outrageous? Is anybody surprised by those definitions? I mean, I think they're pretty straightforward, right? But then when you think about it, what does it mean to you specifically? When you think of the word priority, what comes to mind in your life? What would you say is your priority? It's not a very, I mean, I, I, on the surface it sounds simple, but as you start to think about it, when you break it down, you can break it down in so many different ways. So let's simplify it a bit. I think we have... Uh, quite a few parents in here, I, I, I assume. If you think about it, as a parent, what would you say is your priority? Any volunteers? As a parent, what would be your priority? There's no wrong answer here, guys, unless your wife disagrees. So be careful. <laughs> Raising your kids in church. Raising your kids in church. Good. Good. Absolutely. I think a lot of us would agree that that's, that's a pretty good priority. And, and it's kind of funny, but when I was thinking about this, Something really odd happened four or five years ago that came to mind. And it's, it's funny because as I sit down and I type a lot of my sermons out, I look out my front window and there's an oak tree there. 
And some years ago, I can't remember what I was doing, but this was a time when my wife's second youngest sister and her children were living with us. And as I was working from the table, I kept looking outside, and we have a, a young oak tree. It's maybe 20, 20 plus years old, but it's a beautiful big oak tree. And I kept seeing a lot of movement out there. And I was wondering, what are these kids doing? I kept going away, and then I see one of them comes out with a small step ladder. Whatever, okay. Then another one's moving bricks closer to the tree. All right, now I gotta start getting a little concerned. Next thing you know, they're wearing helmets. <laughs> All right, I mean, am I gonna wanna follow the year award if I let this keep going on? I didn't really pay it too much mind. I can't recall what I was doing exactly, but a few minutes go by, and my youngest and my second oldest are in the tree all of a sudden. Like from one minute to the next, they're in the tree. Their cousin, Hendrick, so mind you, the oldest Hendrick at this point might be nine or 10 years old. My middle child's eight. My youngest would have been about five or six. The five or six year old and the 10 year old are in the tree. Or the eight year old, yeah, are in the tree. Hendrick was the oldest, he was 10. And Hendrick is pushing the tire swing up to them. And that's when I said, okay, I need an adult moment here. Let me go outside and investigate what's happening. And it was, it was pretty, pretty funny because what, what they were doing is um, they got the, the, the brick out and the little step stool or step ladder so that the, my youngest could get in the tree with the help of her oldest and her cousin. And their plan was they were going to get in the tire swing and they were going to swoosh down and swing back and forth. And they all, I don't know how they cooked up this idea, but in their minds, it was great. I mean, come on, they had helmets on. What was the worst that could happen? And I come out and I, and I can't help but laugh quickly, of course, stop. Whatever you're doing, don't do it. And I just start laughing. I'm like, what are y'all thinking? And they said, oh, yeah, it's just going to be great. We're just going to swing and see how high we could get. I said, wow, okay, well, that, that's pretty amazing. I said, but you're going to come back and you're going to hit the tree. They said, no, that's why Hendrick is at the bottom. He's going to stop them from hitting the tree. It's <laughs> like, okay, but you two have helmets, but Hendrick doesn't. And I got to tell you, a little part of me on the inside was like, I really wanted to see how this was going to work out. <laughs> but as a priority, going back to priority, you know, as a parent, yes, raising your kids right, making sure that they're safe. Right, making sure that, that you're walk, looking out for them, for their well-being. And I broke their hearts when I told them to come down from the tree and never touch my ladder again. You know, but it, it's, it's funny though, right? Because as we mature, as we grow, you know, for me, if I was their age, I probably would have been encouraging it. But now as their father, my priorities have changed. I want them to be safe. I want them to be cared for. I want them to be healthy. They just want to have fun. Right? But our priorities change as we grow older, right? So now, how about a bit of a different approach here? Within a marriage, priorities shift as well, don't they? In fact, we know that within marriages, a lot of the arguments and disagreements that couples have are because of differences in opinion when it comes to our priority. You have some that say we spend too much. Some that say, well, we don't earn enough. So it's not that we spend too much, it's that we don't make enough money. So there's a greater focus on money, there's a greater focus on spending, there's a greater focus on how we spend our time. And so there's a disagreement in priorities. So priorities are important at home, at work, at school, in your relationships, and more importantly, perhaps, within the church. When it comes to God, priorities are important. And as big and significant of a word as that is, believe it or not, the word priority is not anywhere in the Bible. In Spanish or in English, you look it up. I grabbed my exhaustive concordance. It's that huge book that weighs about 30 pounds. You know, and I went through it. It's not there. Isn't that interesting? Priority, as important as it is, it's not in the Bible. However, we do see in quite a few places where our priorities are laid out for us. And that's really what we're seeing here in our open verses, believe it or not. That there are about many things. There's a lot that's going on in these verses. And they should hopefully be familiar, right? Because it's about the Exodus. What we're seeing in chapter 19 and into 20 is what God says to the people after the Exodus. Which is really interesting because you think about what took place prior to the Exodus and what they're saying now. And we'll put this all together. But what we're seeing, though, is that after 430 years of being slaves in Egypt, they're now free. Imagine that for a moment. 430 years of captivity in the land of Egypt. 
And now they're free. And how were they free? In an absolutely amazing and impressive way. You had the plagues. Then you had the parting of the sea. Then you had God leading them in, in a cloud by day and in a fire by night. It's pretty awesome. It's absolutely amazing when you think of that. And now we come here where God's going to descend on this mountain. And he's giving instruction for 430 years. And now they're no longer under the rule of the Egyptians. So that's what leads us to the Ten Commandments. But think about that for a moment. I don't think any one of us here has any idea what kind of emotion they were going through. Especially considering that after 430 years, all of them were born into this captivity. All of them were born into this slavery, into this way of life. Think about what they knew about God up to that point. Nothing. Or very close to nothing. You know, and as I think about this, and I try to imagine what that must have felt like to then be free. Anybody here ever have detention in school? I, I had detention, uh, unfortunately, more than once. Yeah. And on very various occasions in school years, I was not the best of kids. That's okay. All right, that's part of my testimony, Now I'm going to share some of it. <laughs> so uh, I remember being stuck in detention, and one of the worst times was with my shop teacher. This is when we lived in Panama, and I had to stay after. And detention could take various forms, right? Sometimes you sat for almost two hours after school, and you could talk to nobody. You couldn't move. You couldn't do anything. And then sometimes they make you write an essay on why, how you got there, and what you're going to do to prevent it from happening in the future. Like, that was going to work. No, it didn't work. And then sometimes, like my very cruel shop teacher, he made you write, I will not do X, Y, Z. I'm not going to give you all the details of why I was in detention. But I would not do this, and you'd have to write that 500 times before you could leave. And I remember the very first time that ever happened. I was so proud that I actually did it. I counted it all out. I was done. I handed it to my shop teacher. He said, oh, this is great. And he folded it and he ripped it into pieces. And he told me, you can go ahead and leave. I remember feeling free. <laughs> like I want something great and big. And I think about that. And it's funny how that comes to mind when I'm thinking about how I compare the feeling of being released from captivity of 430 years. I did detention. And I felt phenomenal getting out of there. So imagine 430 years of captivity, how that must have felt. And I think to some degree, it was probably a little bit disorienting, not really sure what comes next. So whatever we think of, whatever times that we may have been when we were stuck in a place that we didn't want to be or that we were in a situation that we wish we could get out of, I don't think any of us have any life experiences that would compare to our people being trapped for 430 years in captivity. So keep that in mind when we go back through the opening verses. Now the verses that we open with do give some information about everything that happened before the Ten Commandments. So if you read Exodus 1 through 19, that's what it's all about. It leads up to this point that we're at right now. And it's important to note, though, that these people didn't really know anything about God. Only what they had been handed down from their elders. That was all that they had. It was purely word of mouth, stories that were passed down from generation to generation. So otherwise, all that they knew about any God, lowercase g, or gods, was from the culture that they were immersed in, which was the Egyptian culture, which we know was extremely pagan. We know this. So as we review these opening verses, it's important to keep that context in mind. It's always important that when you're reading through the Bible that you uh, acknowledge the context from which it was written. And otherwise, you really miss a lot of the fruit that you would bear from those verses. So if we go back to Exodus 19, starting in verse 18, it says, Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Now you have to pause there. I think Hollywood has really done a number on, on our imagination, right, on actually bringing these words to life. When you pause and you read that, if you read too quickly, you're going to miss the point. I mean, this is an amazing, an amazing moment here. Ma try to imagine the scene because it's very vivid. It's very descriptive. God descended on this mountain and it was covered in smoke. And then the mountain shook violently. It says, the words are, and the whole mountain quaked violently. And there were loud trumpets and they were getting louder. And then God spoke to Moses. And when, and when he spoke, he spoke through the thunder. That's pretty amazing. Would that get your attention? That would certainly get my attention. Have you ever been in an earthquake? One, my family and I had the distinct honor, I guess, of moving from South Carolina to California. My dad was in the Army, and we actually moved in 1989. And for
For some of y'all, that, might, that year might not mean a lot, but that was the year that Hurricane Hugo came through South Carolina. It was a Category 5. It was one of the strongest Category 5s that came through there. And so we got to experience Hurricane Hugo, and then a few weeks later, we packed up the car and drove from South Carolina to California. And we were there for the 7.8 earthquake that hit in San Francisco. We'd never, we had just been there a couple weeks. We were getting ready to watch the Oakland Athletics take on whoever it was. We were sitting on top of, uh, in our guest housing, and then we thought a truck hit the guest housing that we were in. We had no idea what had happened. We, we were only there for a couple weeks, and then after that initial jolt, everything went crazy. It was absolute madness. The feeling of not being able to control your body, the way that things are swaying, and then you run outside and you see the trees just swaying. Like they're made of rubber and the roads are wavy like, like you might see at the ocean. It was incredible. It was disorienting. It was frightening. It was absolutely frightening. The power in an earthquake is impressive. And so we had been part of that. And then, of course, being in California, we were there for almost five years. Uh, we got to experience that on a very regular basis. But nothing to that extent. That was one of the strongest earthquakes that have hit uh, the western coast. And so when your world shakes around you, believe me, it gets your attention. You're not really sure what's happening. It's disorienting. But it's also awe-inspiring because the amount of power is just amazing. And this is how God chose to make his interest. This is how God chose to make his presence felt through an earthquake and through thunder. It's an amazing display of power. The gods, supposed gods of Egypt could never come close to anything like this. And so we continue in verse 20. It says, The Lord came down to Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. But why? Why such a strong warning? Why the limits? Have you ever read through these chapters and asked, actually pause and ask yourself these questions? Why is the Lord telling them not to go up to the mountain? Why is he continually warning them not to do so? And then we kind of sound like children when we do, right? But why? But why? I've got three girls. The most annoying question. Of course, you're all excited when they learn to, to talk. But then when they learn to ask questions, it's like, oh, gosh, please stop. <laughs> why? It's like the worst one. But why? Don't touch that because it's hot. But why? You know what? Touch it. <laughs> just, just go ahead, get it out of your system. No, but why? We want to know why. And we're going to answer that in a few moments, but keep in mind again that these are people that don't know of God. They've heard the stories. They've heard some, some history through some of the elders that was passed down from generation to generation, but they don't know God. And so God is setting limits. He's making sure that they understand, right, that when God says something, we have to be obedient. We have to obey. Yes, it's okay to ask some questions, but in the end, it's all about obedience and disobedience. So he's laying out the rules very clearly here. And so... <clears throat> In verse 23, Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to them to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to them, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. I love how, how Moses kind of talks back to them. He says, look, they're not going to come up here. We already told them not to come up here. And what does the Lord say? Like, no, you go down there, you come back up here with Aaron, but again, don't let them come up here. I would have been uh, imagined that Moses was a little bit frustrated. So, okay, fine. I'll go back down there and I'll tell him what I've already told him. What we already told him, that's fine. I'm not saying that's what he said, but in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. He may have been thinking. So God clearly told him to go back down, warn the people, and come up with, uh, with Aaron. But doesn't that sound like a lot of us when we were kids? Our parents tell us something that they've already told us, but then they insist on reminding us again. I think that's probably one of the worst things I can do as a parent. I try not to. I try to say one thing once. Hope that you get it and do it as I say, but then in my, in, in my parenting genes, I have to want to make sure that they're successful, that they're doing what I really want them because it's going to save me some anxiety later on. I have to imagine that's kind of what he might have felt like, what Moses might have felt like. But God doesn't move. He says, go and do what I told him. So Moses went and did as God told him. And what happens next is extremely important. The following events are so critical for all of us. So, you know, what happens next is key to our relationship with God. The word spoken by God as we move into chapter 20 should lay the foundation for our faith. In fact, the following words should define us as Christians. 
Moving on to chapter 20, verse 1. Now, bear in mind, too, that we break down the Bible in chapters for our own purpose and for our own good use. But in the original scriptures, there are no chapters. So this is all one series of events. There's no pause in events here. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Priority. That's what these verses are about. As a Christian, what is your priority? As a church, what is our priority? And it's funny that how we like to break down priorities down to many pieces. But the fact is that in the original text, the word priority is singular. It's singular. It's one thing above all else. We made it plural. We added the IES to the end. But priority in its original text, in its original form, is a singular word. It should be one thing above all other things. One word, priority. So as Christians... As a church, our priority must be that we take God seriously, that we take our relationship with God seriously, that as Christians, our mission together should be one that honors and glorifies his name above all else. You know, Sundays, Sundays are an important day for us. We come together as a church, we worship, we praise, we share stories, we pray for each other, right? We, we, we receive a message, right? But really... How pointless is church if at the end of the day we're not taking God seriously, we're not holding him in highest esteem, that he's not our singular priority. And you see this. Easter and Christmas are great examples. I don't think there's any greater example of how the world truly views a relationship with God than what we see on Easter and on Christmas Eve. Right? You see this enormous boom in church attendance on Easter Sunday or on Christmas Eve. People that you haven't seen since the previous Easter Sunday or Christmas Eve, right? Your, your attendance doubles or it triples. The church is packed. Everybody's great on here. Everybody's wearing their best dress or what have you. You know, they're all dressed nicely. I'll probably put on a tie every now and then, but I'm there most Sundays anyways. But that's what you see. They're all there because for one or two Sundays a year, they feel like they should attend church. Most of them out of obligation. Mothers are pushing them to join them. Husbands and wives are pushing their spouse that normally wouldn't attend service to at least come this one day or two days out of the year. But then what about the rest of the year? Every other day of the year, we're too busy. We're too busy worrying about things that have zero eternal, eternal meaning or eternal value. We take our jobs, our studies, our schoolwork, our relationships. We take all those things seriously. We put those as a priority above all other things. We take seriously our responsibilities to our families, to our spouses, to our children. But when it comes to God... When it comes to God, maybe it doesn't even rank in our top ten, except for maybe one or two Sundays out of the year. But Jesus tells us clearly, again, the word priority is not mentioned in the Bible, but Jesus tells us very clearly, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, he tells us very clearly where our priority should be in this. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34 say, Do not worry then, saying, What are we to eat? Or what are we to drink? What are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first. Remember the definitions that I put out earlier. That we put one thing before all others. It says seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We're clearly got called to make God our priority take him seriously, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so as Christians, as a church, our priority must be that we take God seriously. It must be that, that our number one priority is God and our service to him and, and, and honoring and glorifying his name and, and going out and seeking the lost for his kingdom. 
As believers, this has to be the foundation of our, of our faith, of our relationship with God, that we take him seriously, that we make him uh, the, the one and only priority in our lives. Yes, and, and then if you ever notice, when you actually put your priority in order, what happens? Everything else just seems to fall in place. When God's first in our lives, when he's the head of our household, our marriages seem to work better. When we honor God, when we honor him with our tithes, with our offerings, our work just seems to be nonstop keeps coming in and we continually be blessed. Our children, when we take God seriously, when God is our priority, our children are raised in a much more healthier manner that's outside of anything that they would ever experience on social media, in the news, on whatever outlets that we're watching in the world. Isn't that amazing? When God is our priority, sometimes things just seem to work out so much better. I say sometimes because sometimes they're also we're tested, and that's okay, and that happens, but I would, I would be willing to say that the majority of us that have put God in his rightful place, have experienced the amazing blessing that it is to have him in our lives and to serve him and want to glorify his name. Unfortunately for us, though, we're also given clear instructions on where to start. When you think about this, you say, okay, how do I do this? That's what's so great about the Bible. You can almost look at it as a how-to document, right? And so God doesn't leave anything open to interpretation. He gives us clear instructions on where to start, how our focus is clearly, and it's clearly laid out here in Exodus 20. When we think about making God our priority, we should look no further than Exodus 20. Look at this in verse 1 again. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It's very easy to read these verses and think, you know what? This is just for those that are part of the Exodus. Right? For the people of Israel that just left. These are the words for them. No, these words are for every single one of us. You shall have no other gods before me. Who were you a slave to before God came into your life? What other gods have you put before him before he rescued you? These people were slaves for 430 years to the Egyptians. Our story is not so much different. It's really not. We're all slaves. We're all encapsulated. And captured by something else that took our attention away from God. We were all slaves to something in our lives that wasn't God. Where were you before God rescued you? What was your God then? For a lot of us, it could be our work. It could be a love of money, drugs, alcohol, pornography, material possessions. And for many of us, even though we won't admit it, our family. Was our family what we put before God? Are you still worshiping that God? Taking God seriously means that we leave behind what we were before, which is exactly why God pulled all the people together and made sure that they understood that he's supposed to be revered, that he should be honored, that there should be uh, an obedience that goes with his name. That's why he reminded Moses so many times, you just make sure that the people understand. Right? That when I speak, you have to listen. You have to listen. I mean, come on. He shook the whole mountain called their attention. He wanted to make sure that they understood what he was about to say to them, that he had their full, undivided attention. And it's amazing how God does that sometimes, right? We're not listening. He's been telling us something for a while. We are praying about it. He gives us the answer. We don't like the answer. We keep trying to go against him. What does he do? He shakes up our life. He absolutely shakes our mouth. He shakes our foundation. He gets our attention. That's what he was doing here in Exodus 19 and 20. So what were you before you God is not where you should be now that you know God, that he's rescued you. Everything, all your old ways, all your old gods, all your false idols should all be a thing of your past. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. And again, it's so great to read this and think that you were reading just this great story. It's easy to read this and nod up and down and say, man, those Israelites must have had it tough. Wow, I'm so glad that I'm not in their shoes. Wrong. Every single one of us are either currently in very similar shoes or have been in the past. It's very easy to think that this is just a great story about those people back then. And if we only had the first three verses, it could be very easy to think that too. And then when we apply it to ourselves, we could try to oversimplify it. We, we, we love to do that. We say, well, but, but maybe what it really means is this. And if you only read the first three verses, you can do that quite easily. You say, oh, okay, don't have other gods before, before him. Check, I'm good. No, no, there's a verse four, five, and six that we covered, that we read through earlier. So you have to keep reading. Read it to the end. 
Again, our God is a God of order and a God of clarity. He doesn't leave it up to us and our own interpretations. Thank, thankfully so, because we're horrible, right? I mean, we love to just kind of think, whittle things out and make it fit for our needs and what we think, and then we want to feel good about it. We don't want to have to think about what we have to carve out of our lives. We don't, have to, we don't want to have to think about how we're really doing when it comes to our relationship with God. We don't really want to give too much thought about our priority because really, I'm more about me than anything else. And so long as I'm okay, then maybe I'll go to church. Or even worse, you know what? I'm so okay, I don't need to go to church. And it's easy to do that when you misinterpret the scriptures. And so he doesn't want misunderstanding. So in his mercy and in his grace, he clarifies what he means. And we move on to verse 4, and it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love and kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You should have no other gods before me. Easy enough. You should have no idols of anything on the earth, in the heavens or in the earth below or in the water beneath it. Nothing. It's not just gods, it's idols, things that we worship. That's when you think about the word idol, you think about something that, that's carved out. Something that's made by our hands, something that's not from God. Uh, I, my dad and I, in June, we went up to Alaska, one, one of those bucket list items, we went fishing. We wanted to do that for a while. My dad came up to me in March or April and said, hey, let's just go to Alaska and go fishing. I said, you know what, let's do that. Phenomenal. We had a wonderful time. We went to a place called Ketchikan. And Ketchikan is very well known for the, um, the totem poles. Very, very intricate designs, very cool. We went and we, and we looked at them, but I thought to myself, these are all idols. And, and, and when these words came to mind, I thought of those idols, things that we make, that we worship, that we put before God. And those are, they can be material things. They can be our family. They can be the car that we drive. They can be the house that we really want. Things that we put before God that we want to go after and we give greater importance. We put before him as a priority. So great, you don't have any other gods before him, but what about things that you're worshiping ahead of him, things that you're going after, things that mean more to you than your relationship with God? I think about that all the time, and I especially think about that when it's tax season. Right? We all just went through that. Because the pastor's not going to know about these extra exemptions. You know what? I did this last year. I didn't get anything back. I paid too much. If I move this comma around, Maybe I'll be better off. We all do those things. We try to be very sly about it, but we can't hide anything from God. You know, when, we're, when we are left to our own devices, we can be very creative. But when we're guided by God and his principles that he lays out before us, this shouldn't be an issue for us, but it can be. See, we're no different than the Egyptians. We have a lot of history that drags us down. We have a lot of things in our past that we wish weren't there. We have a lot of things in our past that we have to fight against. Right, that we have to put behind us and put God first. So taking God seriously, though, means that you don't backslide. But sometimes we do. And you know what? That's okay. It's a process. It is a process. We all know that it's not so... That we're, there's no such thing as microwave Christians, right? There's no such thing. Listen, Christianity, our walk of faith is not a sprint. It's a marathon. The difference between a sprint and a marathon is a whole lot of work. I wish it were a sprint. Maybe not today, but 30, 40 pounds ago, probably. You know, I think about this, and, and I think about me personally, and this is what I encourage you all to do, too, is to reflect on this. Because it's been one heck of a year. It's been a crazy ride. The last 18 months have been something that I wish I could forget. Right? But it's been, it's been also a huge blessing. But when I look back on it, I look back on, hey, we just, you know, we just started July, and it's almost over. Right? July just happened last week. No, July's almost over. July was that second half of the year. And I don't know you guys, but for me, when I hit that mark, I started to think about what I had hoped to accomplish at the start of the year. Not New Year's resolutions, but simply plans that you lay out for yourself. And I think about what I've accomplished so far, what I've done, what I haven't done so well, what I stopped doing. And it really hit me hard. I have a wonderful morning routine, and I think that's the problem. I think it's become a routine. I always thought that as a good Christian, waking up, having my cup of coffee, and spending my devotional time with God was a great thing to do. And you know what? It is. But I realized that me personally, it became a routine. And 
and I feel like I've lost a little bit of, of that wonderful relationship that I had with God, and I started to take that time for granted. And it's really hit me hard. It, it's amazing. You know, my oldest daughter one time asked me one of the wisest questions I've ever heard, and she was maybe seven or eight years old at the time. She's 15 now. But she asked me, she said, Dad, when you preach, do you learn anything? Where did that question come from? So when you preach, do you learn anything? And I smiled. And I said to my I said to myself, wow, this kid is amazing. And I told her, I said, you know what, Amor? I think that when I preach, I learn the most. Because I have to reflect on these words and this message just, if not more so, critically, and apply them to myself as the one that's preaching them. And I'll tell you that I have had a battle of a time this year. I've really backslid on some things. I still have my devotional time in the morning, but my goodness, it feels like it's just more out of custom than actually seeking a deeper relationship and maintaining a deeper relationship with God. And that's hard. That's a hard truth to swallow. And then come here and preach on Sunday. Right? But it's for all of us. These messages are for all of us. Taking God seriously, making sure that he's priority in our lives is something that we all need to consider. But you know what? It's also not just about taking and, and, and preaching his word, but it's also about taking his word seriously as well. Taking his word seriously, and we'll think about that here in a second, but I, I, I want to ask you, do you take his word seriously? When you read the Bible, do you actually try to chew on that throughout the day? You don't have to read through the Bible in a year. I did it when I first became a Christian just because I thought I'd get like a merit badge for it. I didn't get a merit badge for it. There was no fanfare. There wasn't a whole lot of recognition or pats on the backs or high fives. I just... I got to tell people I read through the Bible in a year. I haven't read through it in a year since then. I've read through it many more times since then. But really it's about being with God, being in his word, and, and learning from it. Developing your relationship, developing your spiritual muscle as well. But that starts by taking his word seriously. You ever been talking to somebody and they notice that you didn't have their full attention? You ever done that? Like, like you're telling a story, like you're very passionate about this thing that you want to tell them. Or, or maybe you've waited all day for your spouse to come home so you can share this great news with them, with them. And then you're talking to them, and you can totally tell they are nowhere near where you are in this story. They're like there, but they're completely distant. Ladies, do not look at your husband, although you're probably thinking about your that, and it's okay. My wife would do the same thing. But you ever been there where, where you're passionate about something? You're sharing something with somebody, and they're gone. They're on another universe, they're on another planet. And you think to yourself, my goodness, this person's not taking me seriously. Ever happened to you? I think from the nods and the chuckles, it has. Maybe this morning, I don't know. That's between you guys. Um, but we do the same with God. When we pick up his word and we read it and, and think that it's some kind of a great story, maybe there's a great lesson there, but then there's nothing more and we don't apply it to our lives, we're doing the exact same thing to God. When we read his commandments and think that they're just great concepts, but our times change. And so because our times change, maybe these commandments aren't as important today as they were then. They're exactly as powerful and as appropriate today as they were then. Even greater still, you want to see where you are with God's word and how seriously you take his word. Pick up your Bible, open it to Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does that mean to you? Do you believe that? Or do you question what it really means? Because, you know, science, science tells us differently. The world, popular opinion says different, that maybe this isn't to be taken as clearly as it's written. Do you just laugh because you're not sure if it's true? If that's your attitude, then you really have to wonder if God's a priority in your life, if you're really taking him and his word seriously. And it's sad. But think about that. When we read these words, we should be in awe and Hollywood has done away with our sense of awe. But when we read Genesis 1, chapter, verse 1, we should be in awe because it says, In the beginning, God. What does that mean to you? How do you apply that? How, did you ignore that? Do you reject it? Do you think that it's just a great story that kind of gets us in our mindset for the rest of the scripture? Or are you taking them seriously? Because if you're not, if, 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 you, if you have a hard time even fathoming the wonder and the amazement of that short verse. You dishonor God. You dishonor his word. And I know I can make it sound like it's simple or it's easy. It's not. It takes time. right? It's a process. Taking God seriously is a lifelong process. But God is our priority. 
is something that we need to strive for on a regular basis. And, and, and what does that look like, though? What does that look like to you as an individual, as the head of your household, as the head of your family, as a husband and wife? What does God as a priority mean? That's something that you have to reflect on. How do you start? Hey, prayer. I can't say it enough. Reflection and prayer. It's something personal. I can't give you the instructions. I can only tell you that you have to go before God. You have to examine your life. Look at the idols that you're still carving out for yourself. Look at the things that you're putting before him, the people that you're putting before him, his relationship. And think about how that's affecting you personally, how that's affecting your relationship with God, your relationship with your wife, your children, your work. Think about how it's affecting your work here as a church. When God's not our priority. We have a hard time flourishing. We have a hard time reaching the lost. We have strife within the church. It affects every facet of our life. So I invite you. Take that time to reflect on where you are, where you had hoped you would be, and do an honest assessment of yourself, and then as a couple, and as a family, and determine what you have to do to change. And sometimes the change is painful. It's absolutely painful. I remember when it came time for me to, to make a decision to turn my life over to Christ, I thought about all the many things, and I am so grateful for it now, but I will tell you, it was painful then. I had to do a lot of cleaning up in my world, a lot. I'm going to tell you, I'll be honest with you, it's my testimony now. I'm not ashamed of it. But for me, it started with my music. My music. I, listen, I, I, I my, thank God with my wife and I, we got a new car, and I got to tell you, the most awesome thing about it is the sound system. I love loud music. I, listen, just because I got rid of all the bad music does not mean I still don't like my music loud. Okay, that had nothing to do with it. It was the lyrics, it was the words that were being said. It was horrible. I got rid of that. I can still play my music loud. Right, but... I had to acknowledge that one, I wanted to be right with God. And two, I wanted to be a better father to my children. And having that music was an idol that I was dragging around behind me all the time. It was holding me back from developing a stronger relationship and taking my God seriously. So I got together, I don't know how many thousands of dollars worth of CDs. Yes, for those that don't know, music was on a CD back in the day. And before that, it was on records and on tapes and on eight tracks. You can download it, you had to have it with you. If you were lucky enough, you had a CD changer in your car, and that was awesome. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> I had to take, I don't know how many thousands of dollars worth of CDs, and I had to throw them away. I thought about giving them away. But then I thought about, well, what am I doing? I'm just giving it to somebody else, and it's going to be a, step, a stumbling block for them. So I, I felt even worse, like, oh, gosh, I can't do this. No, I threw them away. And not only did I throw them away, I, I, I scratched them up, and I broke them before I threw them away. Think about that. That's just my testimony. That's one of many things that I had to do away with. And you know what? I'm still a work I think all of us are, but I think that there's also a point in our lives when we have to truly acknowledge if we're backsliding a bit. I backslid this year. As I said, I backslid big time. I started taking my time with God as just a routine. And not, not a wonderful blessing that it is to actually be able to enjoy my quiet time with God, and I view it as a routine, as a check mark to start my day. Where are you at with your relationship with God? Can I encourage every single one of you here to take some time to reflect and pray about that and be serious about your relationship with God take him as a priority, if he is truly a priority. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your message, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you because, Lord, there's just there's just no guesswork when it comes to you, Lord. There's just no guesswork when, when you speak clearly to us, Lord. You always show us exactly what it is that you need, Lord. You always show us through your love and mercy for how we should look to you, for how we should honor and glorify your name in all that we do, Lord. And we struggle Every single one of us here struggles, Lord. Again, as I said, you know, I've, I've been struggling with the most of this year. And I thank you. I thank you for opening my eyes, Lord. I thank you for opening my heart to acknowledge how sometimes I, I put things before you, and that's wrong. That's right. That's not how it should be, Lord. Help us to put you first, Lord. Help us to be honest about what it is that's holding us back. Lord, to be honest about how we need to adjust our lives, adjust our, our path. Lord, and, and, and then consider the testimony that we're putting out there, Lord, when we say that we worship you, Lord, we praise you in your name, Lord, and how much we love you, and yet we dishonor you through our actions, through the things that we say and the things that we do in front of our family, Lord, and at work, are we honoring you? Is it evident that you are priority in our lives, Lord? Help us to reflect on that, Lord. Give us the strength to make the changes, Lord, that are necessary to put us back on track, Lord, as, as individuals and as your church. Lord,